Hi friends, welcome to the War Heroes channel. Today, we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. So, the decision would be made within a few hours. I quietly crept into our room. Paulus was breathing deeply and quietly. I could not sleep. I frantically sought to bring order to the thoughts revolving in my head. They centered around Paulus, who was lying only an arm's length away from me on his camp bed. He qualified first as a talented general staff officer, for whom a marvelous career was predicted. And where had fate brought him? Was it really fate that had sentenced him in his quarter of a million strong army to defeat? To what extent were one's own faults, military and human, attributable to misfortune? Was not the cause of our debacle to be found much earlier, long before the battle on the Volga? I recalled several remarks Paulus had made about his role as deputy chief of the army staff when he had participated in the planning of the war against the Soviet Union. Would it not have been much better not to have begun the Eastern Campaign, indeed the whole war? Was there actually a war aim that could justify these streams of blood, these mountains of rubble, these tears of pity? The war against Soviet Russia was begun on necessary preventive grounds, we were told, necessary to protect us from the threat of Bolshevism. Actually, I could never believe it. What I personally experienced on the 22nd June 1941 and in the following weeks of the Eastern Campaign gave absolutely no indication that the Red Army was prepared for a war of aggression, but much more showed that it was no way ready for war, nor sufficiently prepared for defense. In the year and a half of engagement on the Eastern Front, I had gained the impression that in former Tsarist Russia, whose hopeless backwardness I knew from the First World War, forces were now at work that wanted to make something new and big, but the difficulty still had not been overcome. Was it really illogical that the ruler in the Kremlin first chose to develop the enormous possibilities of this powerful land, instead of playing with the questionable idea of overrunning Germany? But why, if that was so, if this war from our side was not worth defending, had it been necessary at all? Terrible. Then all the blood and frightfulness of this war remained clinging to our fingers. Could I continue living under such a terrible burden? Would I ever get a clear answer to my question of the sense of our downfall after the justification of this war? I was as bewitched. During these hours of the night I sought answers clarity. Instead of finding them, I became involved in further questions and ever more lack of clarity. It soon seemed as if in the 40 years of my conscious life, I had asked too few questions, as if too much had seemed too clear and problem-free, as if too much had seemed important that in fact was not. Was this really my life, running on what tracks? I saw before me my parents' farm in Eichen, near Hanau and Maine, the pride but also the burden of my clever father and my hardworking mother, who died much too young. Their whole love and concern were for their two sons, my older brother and I. Our parents did everything to give us a happy childhood. They, as well as our grandparents, set us certain standards and norms for life. Thus, my father was connected with his home earth, a capable farmer honored and respected in the village. The word Germany had in his mouth a high, self-conscious sound. That was much like my grandfather on my mother's side, he was mayor at the head of the Eichen community for over 25 years. He sat as a member of the provincial parliament in Kassel and was an ardent admirer of the old Reich's Chancellor Bismarck. A Wilhelm von Bismarck, as district president of Hanau, was for several years his immediate superior. It was in this atmosphere that my brother and I were brought up to love our homeland and be faithful to our ruling house. My parents' upbringing had a substantial influence on my life which was further developed at school and later at the teacher's training college with a number of illustrative materials and slides. For instance, from 1910 to 1913, I had a geography teacher who could not give a lesson without making some hateful remark about England. Deep into our minds were sown the roots of sources of German arrogance, German nationalism, even chauvinism. The love of Germany, love of our country, was for my grandfather and my father, for myself and most of my generation coupled with the feeling of German superiority, a claim to superiority in the world, the need to fight and exploit a legitimate right, and our holy duty. The First World War was a logical consequence of this. 
There was nothing frightful about it for me. Like many tens of thousands, I marched off inspired to protect the Thromen altar. I came back bitter and disappointed that Germany had lost the war. At odds with the injustice of fate, I sought forgetfulness in studying and teaching. But soon my pleasure in the teaching trade faded. I was teaching at the school in Langenselbo, a working community near Hanau and Maine. In my memory appear many blonde, brunette or black heads, how the faces glowed with zeal when we opened a tumulus, laid the ground for a specific local museum, or improved our strength with sport and games. The older ones among my then pupils must have long since donned military uniforms. How many of them had fallen or been wounded, I did not now know. Following my return to military service as a teacher of mathematics at the Weimar Army Trade School in January 1929, in my enrollment as a captain in the Wehrmacht in 1934, I maintained only a loose connection with my previous work as a teacher. One face from that time which had especially imprinted itself on my mind was Roeder's. He was a communist, apparently the only one that I had got to know then. I had two of his sons in my school. The father willingly assisted us as a hard worker and gave us various plans and projects. I got on well with him, however. When it came to talking about politics, I waved him off. I was not interested. I left him with the phrase that one was hearing more and more. Hitler means war. When the First World War had ended with the defeat of Germany, I was annoyed that I could no longer remain an officer. The desire to be an officer increased in me during the whole time of the Weimar Republic. In 1934, the second year of Hitler's rule came fulfillment. I forgot the communist rudder almost completely and was proud of the successes that Hitler obtained. General conscription, the Air Force, a U-boat fleet, the occupation of the Rhineland, the return of the Saar, the acquisition of Austria, the occupation of the Sudetenland, the formation of the Bowman Marin Protectorate. Did these successes not confirm our right and our claim to leadership, and all without war, with it came the ending of unemployment and the arrival of the Autobahns? Hitler was indeed the genial leader, which was how I saw him then. My grandfather was still living, having also replaced Bismarck with Hitler. Certainly he had done some unpleasant things, the arrest of communists and some others. They were isolated in camps, one was told. Humanly regrettable, I said to myself, thinking of Roeder. But why did they oppose a development that made Germany unmistakably stronger and mightier? I felt myself remote from Kristallnacht and other repressive measures against the Jews. But in the end, I was not responsible for it. And moreover, one should not forget the great results that National Socialism had brought to the German people. So I sought to unburden myself. A little thorn of doubt remained within me. But what significance did it have in contrast to the unending appearance of Hitler's chain of happy accomplishments? Then came the 1st September 1939 in war against Poland. I detected then that a new section of Hitler's policies had begun, a more earnest section. The communist Rauder had been right so far, but the Polish campaign was over in just eight days, a great victory obtained. During this time, France and England had stood by with their weapons ready. Denmark and Norway were also occupied only half a year after Poland. Then the strongest military nation on the continent, France, was overrun in six weeks and forced into unconditional surrender, the insult of Versailles eradicated. The British learned how to run, as we put it, at Dunkirk and were quickly chased into the sea. Another great victory, perhaps the greatest in the comet-like rise of the Third Rake. Unfortunately, it had demanded a hard sacrifice from my wife and I. Our son Heinz fell on the 16th May 1940. That was a hard blow, a pain that others attributed to the unpleasant aspects of the Nazis. He was my own flesh and blood, my only son. My wife never recovered from this loss. This too gave my heart pain when I thought about it. But as a soldier, he was prepared to die for Germany, for the fatherland, as I believed, as a sacrifice. Again, the fanfare sounded for victories, announcing successes in the U-boat war in Africa and in the Balkans. Despite a few minor setbacks, the German chain of luck seemed to grow to broader, more handsome bounds. Then came the 22nd June 1941. The German Wehrmacht advanced along a front of some 2,000 kilometers against the Soviet Union, supported by Romania and Finnish units. The world held its breath. I, who crossed the Soviet border towards Kovno, 
that day with the 23rd Corps, was not quite in the mood. This was the feared war on two fronts, and we had put ourselves in this position with an attack on a vast enemy about whom we knew very little. But at first it all seemed to go surprisingly well. The fanfares of victory sounded every day. The chain of luck was extended by new important links. Then something happened that we had not experienced in the eight years of Hitler's reign. Next to the chain of luck began a chain of misfortune, and it began with the massive links formed by the German defeats at Moscow and Leningrad, in Kalinin, Smolensk, Oreo, Kursk, Karko, Stalino, and on the Kerch Peninsula in the winter of 1941-42. But these links were small in comparison to the defeats that followed in the winter of 1942-43, especially that of the downfall of the Sixth Army. I was filled with fearful anxiety. Who truly understood this disastrous development? What would become of Germany if the enemy approached the German borders at this rate? How long would the other fronts hold out? What if the destruction of the Sixth Army anticipated the destruction of Germany? These tortuous questions continued to persecute me in the troubled dreams of a short nap. 31st January 1942, 7am. The day dawned pale and hardly noticeably. Paulus was still asleep. It took quite a time before I found a way out of my tormenting thoughts and confused dreams. Then I could have gone to sleep, but it could not have been for long. I already wanted to get up without making a noise when someone knocked at the door. Paulus woke and got up. The chief of staff entered. He handed a piece of paper to the commander-in-chief with the words, I congratulate you on your promotion to field marshal. The radio message was the last to arrive early in the morning. That is just an order to commit suicide, but I will not grant this favor, said Paulus after he had read the message. Schmidt went on. At the same time, I have to tell you that the Russians are outside. With these words, he took a step back and opened the door. A Russian general walked in with an interpreter and declared us his prisoners. I laid our pistols down on the table. Get ready to leave. I will take you from here at 9 a.m. You will drive in your own vehicle, said the interpreter translating for the Soviet general, and they left the room again. It was just as well that I still had my official stamp. I performed my last official duty. I entered in Paulus' pay book his promotion to field marshal and applied the official stamp, which I then threw into the burning stove. Then I went to Rosk, wanting to know what had happened during the night. He reported as follows. As I told you several hours ago, Schmidt had tasked the interpreter to go over to the Soviet tank commander with a white flag. After you had left me, I went over with the interpreter. I could see the tank from the yard entrance, and I could see it clearly, as it had meanwhile come closer. The hatch was open and a young officer was looking out. Our interpreter waved the white flag and approached the tank. I heard him speaking to the Russian. Afterwards, he told me that he had suggested to him. Have the firing stop. I have something quite big. Promotion and awards, you can come with me and take the commander-in-chief and the whole of the 6th Army staff prisoner. The young officer sent a radio message to his commander. Two other officers and some soldiers appeared. They came up to the yard entrance, where I received them. We went down into the cellars by a nearby entrance, which was near Schmidt's room. It had been shut off with sandbags until then, but Schmidt ordered it to be cleared. The negotiations were then conducted in my presence. I suggested that the commander-in-chief be called, but Schmidt refused. Apparently, he wanted it documented that he had conducted the army negotiations in accordance with his wishes. The chief of staff tasked me with conducting the negotiations. He himself would only intervene if he thought it necessary. Meanwhile, a general and several officers had appeared from the Soviet side. After a formal greeting, he tasked me with negotiating the surrender conditions. In doing so, he left no question or proposal to me. When I wanted to agree, Schmidt joined in the talking that he had been holding back from until then. He wanted to introduce some unclear questions. You, Adam, would have been as astounded as I was when I heard. Firstly, whether the field marshal could retain his personal orderly. Secondly, whether he could take some foodstuffs still in his possession with him. Thirdly, whether it was not possible for the field marshal to have a Red Army bodyguard for his personal protection on the journey to captivity. Quite clearly, I was ashamed at this point. I had seen Paul this often in the last weeks and spoken to him. I could not accept that he had given Schmidt such instructions. 
I have been with him for the last few days and gained some insight into his inner self. I also regard this as out of the question. If he had been concerned with such things, he would have discussed them with me and not the chief of staff. But what did Schmidt want to achieve with these demands? Much of this stubborn behavior has also trickled through to the troops. He seems to have a bad conscience. How did the Soviet general respond to these questions? I had the impression that he was as surprised about them as I was. Instead of an answer, he asked the question, where actually was Paulus? Schmidt replied with a smile. The field marshal did not want to become involved in the negotiations, but to be handled as a private person. That was absolute nonsense, as this phraseology was contrary to what had only shortly before been asked of Paulus. The Soviet general must have had a fine impression of German generals. I take this as being a secret of Schmidt's with which he perhaps wanted to gain advantages for himself. Paulus had never charged Schmidt to obtain special conditions for himself. Major General Roski concluded his report with, The last radio message was sent at 0545 AM. The Russians are standing at the door. We are destroying. Several minutes later, the radio station was destroyed. Deeply ashamed about what I had heard, I went back to my room. On the way, I decided not to tell Paulus about it. I wanted to spare him any further stress at this time. I sat at the table completely indifferently. I got up as the time to leave came nearer. Prepare the staff transport to leave, Am. Have two cars and a truck made ready. The big entrance to the cellar was closed and guarded by Red Army sentries. The duty officer permitted me and the driver to enter the yard where the vehicles were parked. I stopped in surprise. Soviet and German soldiers who had been shooting at each other only a few hours ago were standing here in the yard together peacefully, their weapons in their hands were slung. But what a shattering contrast. Here the German soldiers, ragged in thin greatcoats over shabby uniforms as lean as rakes, emaciated, exhausted figures with hollow cheeks and stubble faces. They're the Red Army soldiers, well-kempt, vigorous, in wonderful winter clothing. It made me think back to the chain of luck and the chain of misfortune that had not let me rest the night before. The appearance of the soldiers of the Red Army seemed to me symbolic of the changed conditions of victory and defeat. I was deeply gripped by another observation. Instead of beating our soldiers or even shooting them in the back of the neck, the Soviet men in the midst of the rubble of the city we had destroyed were digging in their pockets for their last pieces of bread their cigarettes and their tobacco to offer to the human wrecks of German soldiers. Punctually at 9 a.m. hours, the chief of staff of the Soviet 64th Army appeared to take away the commander-in-chief of the defeated German 6th Army and his staff. We climbed into our ready vehicles. Paulus and Schmidt took seats in the first vehicle, the Soviet general sitting next to the driver. I went in the second one with a Red Army lieutenant. The remaining officers and men of the staff followed in the truck. The sounds of fighting had completely died away. The southern cauldron had ceased to exist. The central cauldron, commanded until the last by Colonel General Heights, also surrendered on the 31st January 1943. Paulus, still bound by the Hitler order, did not feel himself empowered to order the commanders of the other cauldrons to surrender, as Hitler had appointed them personally. For the troops in the northern cauldron, the inferno went on for another two whole days. Despite the pressing representations of Generals Lapman and von Linsky, the commander of the northern cauldron, Colonel, General Strecker, refused to give up the fighting. Finally, on the morning of the 2nd February 1943, the two generals themselves gave the order to surrender. The battle on the Volga was over. At the head and tail of our small convoy drove a Soviet truck occupied by submachine gun troops. Tightly closed up, the vehicles drove at a slow speed past the snow-covered and still smoking ruins of former housing blocks, administrative buildings, schools, hospitals, theaters, and factories. An immense mixture of German war material of all kinds, destroyed or still intact, crowded the icy streets. In between the remains of the 6th Army dragged themselves into captivity in larger or smaller groups escorted by Red Army troops. Many of the exhausted and emaciated soldiers were supporting each other. Often two half-starved men carried along a wounded man who clung to them. Many cursed us as the shamefully betrayed soldiers recognized the 6th Army's commander-in-chief and his escort in the overtaking vehicles. 
In the last frightful weeks in the cauldron, Paulus had begun to grasp what a vast personal responsibility he bore through his unconditional obedience to Hitler and the army high command. But this reinforced his resignation to the situation and on the other hand enabled his essentially active chief of staff Schmidt to send his last forces senselessly into the fire. Now it was all too late. So much was clear to me on the 31st January 1943 that the question of blame for the defeat of the Sixth Army, for all the generals and high commanders, was that they only surrendered when the Soviet troops appeared right in front of their own bunkers. It need not have come to this picture of distress that we now saw through the windscreens of our vehicles. Accepting the Red Army's offer of surrender of the 8th January 1943 would have spared these thousands of men some three and a half weeks of hunger and icy cold. Their state of health would have been considerably better at the beginning of their captivity when the typhus had not yet broken out so strongly. I found our involvement a great crime. Its exponents were Hitler and the forces high command and the army high command, but also Manstein and his headquarters at Army Group Don that there were deeper roots of guilt, that these persons functioned as representatives and tools of pernicious forces and sinister mental attitudes in German history, I did not then suspect. I was generally physically and mentally so empty and burnt out that I could hardly bring myself to think. To me it was like awakening from a frightful nightmare when the vehicle left the city center and drove across open country in a southerly direction. We were moving forwards quickly now. The Volga soon appeared on our left. After a short stop at several new-looking buildings that apparently served as quarters for a high-ranking staff, the drive went on parallel to the river. Two hours later, we entered Bekataka. We stopped in front of one of the dominating wooden houses. My eyes fell on artistically carved window frames and gables. Then our escorting general was already asking us to enter the building. After we had left our coats and hats in an entrance room, we were led into a larger room, what was going to happen next? As if he wanted to take his leave, Paulus reached out his hand to Schmidt and myself. Goebbels' propaganda had hit us even deeper in the bones than we ourselves wanted. A Soviet general had sat down on the opposite side of the T-shaped table. As it soon turned out, this was Shumilov, the commander-in-chief of the 64th Army. Next to him sat his chief of staff, Major General Laskin, the general who had brought us here and an interpreter with the rank of major. I was directed to a seat on the long side of the table. Schmidt had shortly before told me, apart from giving our personal details, keep quiet about everything else. I found this warning superfluous and tactless. Shumilov addressed our commander-in-chief as von Paulus, whereupon the latter said, I am not of the nobility. The Soviet general looked at him disbelievingly. When Paulus was asked for his rank, he said, Field Marshal, which only increased the mistrust. Then Paulus took his paybook from his inside breast pocket and handed it to the Soviet Army commander. He soon understood it through the interpreter and gave it back with a short hair show. As the interview continued, General Shumilov asked Paulus if he had given the Northern Group the order to surrender. Paulus denied it, as this group came immediately under Hitler. Now something will happen, I thought. Our propaganda had always insisted that the Russians would torture anyone who did not meet their demands. Discreetly, I considered the Soviet commander-in-chief. Shumilov spoke quietly and pertinently. Nothing happened. While I was still in a state of surprise, the general stood up. The interpreter translated his last words. Tell the field marshal that I am asking him to take a drink with me before I drive off to my headquarters. Was this really meant? Outside, Soviet soldiers helped us into our coats. Excitedly, we moved towards the entrance, where Shumilov, wearing a tall fur hat on his head, awaited us. He crossed the road and signed for us to follow him. Was this far enough? I looked around me. No execution squad in sight, but perhaps they were waiting behind the wooden building to which the general was walking. Nothing like it. Shumilov opened the door to a lobby in which an old woman was housekeeping. On footstools stood basins of steaming water and alongside each was a piece of real soap, a luxury I had not seen for a long time. A young girl handed everyone a white towel. Washing was a delight. For days we had only been able to wash our faces and hands in thawed snow water, damply rubbed off. Afterwards we were invited into the next room. There stood a covered table with various things to eat. 
I was ashamed as I sat down at Shumilov's request with Paulus and Schmidt. What lies had been told to us about the bloodthirsty Bolsheviks? And we were so primitive as to believe them. I must think about more generals of the Red Army that had passed through our headquarters as prisoners of war. We other officers of the staff found it beneath our dignity even to say a word to them. They were given only a meal from the field kitchen before being sent back further to the rear. The gentlemanly behavior of the victorious Soviet army commander had made no impression on Schmidt. He whispered quietly to me, Take nothing. If they offer us something to drink, it could be poison. This spoon feeding of instructions was repulsive and annoying. I gave Schmidt an angry look to make him understand. If General Shumilov had understood it, he said quietly, It would be much more pleasant if we had got to know one another under other circumstances. If I could greet you here as my guest and not as prisoners of war. Vodka was consumed by all from the same bottle. The general invited us to drink with him to the victorious Red Army, but we remained sitting motionless. After the interpreter had said a few quiet words, Shumilov laughed. I don't want to upset you. Let us drink to the two brave enemies that confronted each other in Stalingrad. Now Paulus, Schmidt, and I raised our glasses. Not long afterwards, the vodka began to take effect upon our empty stomachs. I felt a light dizziness. This vanished, however, when I took a small bite of bread. Paulus and Schmidt also tucked in. We sat together with General Shumilov for more than an hour. I took in keenly everything I saw and heard. The Major spoke very good German. For the first time I heard that the Soviet people well knew the difference between the Hitler system and the German people. The Soviet officers assured us that despite everything that had happened, trust in the German worker and the German scientists had not been lost. They were nevertheless surprised that so many Germans had let themselves be misused by Hitler. Paulus asked for special attention for the wounded, sick, and half-starved German soldiers, and the Soviet army commander assured him it would be given to the utmost possibility. Do you still have a wish, Field Marshal? Asked Shumilov as the time to go approached. Paulus said briefly, I would like to ask you to let my adjutant, Major Adam, remain with me. General Shumilov gave an instruction to an officer who immediately left the room. Shortly afterwards, he got up and escorted us to the vehicle waiting to take us further on. He said goodbye with a handshake, saying to Paulus, Your wish will be fulfilled. He stood saluting on the edge of the road as the car moved off. He was a truly noble opponent. As our next destination, Shumilov had allotted the front headquarters, which roughly compared with our headquarters. Our vehicle rattled over the battlefield between the Volga and the Don. The night shrouding the horrors of the scene as an icy wind penetrated our vehicle. Hunched together, I sat in a corner of the rear seat next to our staff interpreter, with two Soviet officers in front of me. I was able to orientate myself from the starry sky. We were driving in a northerly direction, but not for long before the vehicle stopped. Pocket torches flashed at a checkpoint. Our escorting officers answered the questions asked. Everything was in order. The vehicle drove on. We experienced these stops and starts several times during the night's journey. The roads were constantly blocked with barricades. I had to think about our officers' escape plan. They would have no chance with such rigid controls. Our small convoy stopped again and I heard my name being called. An officer entered our vehicle and asked me to accompany him. His tone was less friendly. I followed him with my heart thumping. At the head of the column, I was told to get into a small cross-country vehicle, and I had hardly sat down, squeezed in between two officers on the back seat, when it drove off again. There was soon nothing to be seen of the other vehicles. Despite the experience with General Shumilov, I was uneasy. I felt better again when several vehicles appeared behind us at the next stop in one of which I recognized Paulus. We had been underway in this cutting cold since 1500 hours, crushed and half frozen in these vehicles without being able to move much. It was coming up to midnight when I was finally able to climb out in front of a small wooden house. While I was getting out of the vehicle, I noticed that Paulus and Schmidt had left their vehicle. Together we approached the Soviet staff officer standing in front of the building, which was guarded by sentries at each corner. The door opened from inside. The first thing I noticed upon entering was a comfortable warmth. A young senior lieutenant greeted us in German. 
He explained to Paulus and Schmidt that they should occupy a large room in which there were two beds, a table, and several chairs. My sleeping place was in the first room opposite the door of the Brickton stove, which extended deep into the room allocated to the two generals. While our frozen bodies were slowly thawing in the pleasant warmth, a senior officer entered the room and asked Paulus and Schmidt to go with him to the front headquarters, where they were expected by Generals Rokosovsky and Voronov. Meanwhile, the senior lieutenant talked about Moscow, his home city in which he had studied architecture. He talked about the Kremlin, the metro and the theaters. As I expressed my wonder at his command of the German language, I received the information that was later even more frequently encountered in similar form. Many of us learned German, the language of Marx and Engels. I would like to recommend to you that you learn Russian during your captivity. Shortly after 2 a.m., a car brought Paulus and Schmidt back. I learned from them that the interview had followed the same formalities and questions as had occurred with the staff of the Soviet 64th Army. As before in Bekatovka, Paulus asked the commander-in-chief of the Soviet front for the utmost possible help and care for surviving German soldiers and officers. The Soviet general replied, Of course there is not for today or tomorrow sufficient supplies for 90,000 additional mouths, but we will do everything humanly possible for them. We were dead tired and sought to go to bed as soon as possible. I was first awake in the morning when the senior lieutenant gave me a shake. On the morning of the 1st February, we were able to walk around a bit with the senior lieutenant. We did not learn the name of the place that we were in. Our questions about it were met with a shrug of the shoulders. It was unimportant. We were much more interested in the fact that all the surviving generals of the 6th Army would assemble here in the next few days. We were separated from them by a field, so we did not get together with them, but we could watch them taking a daily walk from our little house. During our first days as prisoners of war, the unusual peace and regular meals, I gradually lost the stupefaction and tenseness that had crippled me during the last days in the cauldron. Much more I felt the burden of being hemmed in. Here in this village we had no newspapers or books available. We sat at the table for hours, each busy with his thoughts. Even a look through the window at the level, single-colored snowy landscape could not lighten our dreary mood. Paulus was at the end of his strength. On the 5th or 6th February we were moved, but only for two or three days, then we had to prepare to travel again. Trucks brought all the 6th Army's prisoner of war generals to one of the railway lines passing near the place. On an open stretch by a station master's house was a train, in the middle of which a carriage had been kept free. We were somewhat astounded at the bedsheets, blankets and white covered pillows in the sleeping part of the carriage. An old woman acted as interpreter. Through her the train commandant greeted Paulus and informed him about the situation at the front. We also discovered that there were officers of our army in the other wagons, but nevertheless we were not allowed to make contact. Where were we going, we dared not ask. During the night I stood for some time at the window of our darkened compartment. Larger and smaller settlements went by, they showed no signs of destruction. Only the many troop transports rolling to the front reminded one of the war. Our train rolled along slowly and was often shunted into sidings. Things came alive early in the general's wagon. The washing and shaving took longer, then the attendant brought hot tea into the carriage. I took breakfast with Schmidt in Paulus section. When I looked out of the window again, my eyes found a changed landscape. The dirty gray snow-covered steppe had vanished. Vast woods in their proud winter clothing extended far off on either side of the railway, frequently broken by settlements at whose stations business activity was being conducted. Women in lawn rows offered the products of the countryside, bread, chickens, milk, butter, and many other things needed by people on long journeys. Soldiers on the troop trains and travelers on the regular train services had a brisk need for the items on offer. Every stop at the stations was used to obtain hot water in the tea urns at special taps. Unfortunately, I was unable to decipher the place names at the stations, as I did not know the Cyrillic alphabet. Now and then curious civilians tried to get near our train when we stopped, but they were held back at a respectful distance by our guards. I observed a few scowls from this or that Soviet citizen at those who had devastated their country and brought death to many, but I noticed no offensive gestures against us. How long we traveled I no longer know, but it could have been two or three days and nights. 
One morning we stopped at a station and were told to prepare to leave the train. Another short journey by bus and you will be at your destination, said the train commander to the field marshal. And so there was, we drove through a town, but there was not much to see. My general impression was of a little country town, like many I had got to see during the war. After a few minutes our bus stopped before a closed high wooden gate. To the right of it stood a little wooden house. A high barbed wire fence stretched away on both sides. We were in front of the Krasnogorsk prisoner of war camp near Moscow. Proper camp life was about to begin. The camp commandant and duty officer emerged from the guardroom and asked us to follow some of the guards along the road through the camp. On the right side were three long barrack huts. On the left was a small hut, the cookhouse, which we soon came to. Beyond the cookhouse were another log hut and a barrack hut. Some shelters could be made out further along. The arrival of the Stalingrad generals naturally caused a sensation among the old prisoners of war. Curiously, they stood in aprons and white caps in front of the kitchen or leaned out of the barrack hut windows. The camp did not seem to be strongly occupied. On the third hut on the right of the street was the word ambulatorium. It seemed that this housing even had back doors. We entered one of them and waited in a large room for further developments. This gave me an opportunity to look around. On the door was a notice in the German language. Under the heading Extract from the Orders of the People's Commissar for Defense, I read. Hitler's come and go, but the German people remain. I had heard similar words on the 31st January during our interview with General Schumelup. Somehow it impressed me more at that time. Now I believed, just as the generals also did that it could be dismissed as propaganda. Had I been influenced by being together with them every day, usually sounding arrogant and dismissive. Apparently, in any case, these words would haunt me during the coming months and years. After bathing and delousing, we were divided up among the barracks. Paulus, Schmidt, and I were allocated a room in the log hut. In a large room of this building lived six Romanian generals, and in a smaller room were three Italians. Apart from them, the camp also housed further officer prisoners of war as well as other ranks. German doctor prisoners of war worked in the ambulatorium under the charge of a female Soviet doctor. At first, captivity encompassed a kind of stress and expectation. With a certain agitation, we regarded the unknown and the uncertainty. But this feeling vanished quickly in the sense of regularity. Getting up, three meals a day, walks, afternoon and night sleeps, gave the day its pattern. Early in the morning and late in the evening, the duty officer went through the accommodation. Once a week, we went to the baths to bathe. Hygiene and cleanliness were especially important. Griasno, dirty, was one of the first Russian words I learned from a Soviet doctor's assistant who expected painful cleanliness in the rooms. Even the generals took this young woman seriously when she entered the rooms and looked at the floors, beds, and windows with critical eyes. Our conversation in the first days and weeks turned overwhelmingly to everyday camp matters, to individual episodes in the cauldron battle on the Volga, to previous personal experiences and to families back home. Everyone tried to grasp the concept of imprisonment. Deep discussions about the causes of the catastrophe on the Volga, about blame and guilt, and about its effect on the further progress of the war were temporarily avoided, perhaps because we were all in a kind of mental paralysis, a kind of trance, after the frightful experiences we had gone through, or because our individual consciences were switched off from any connection with Stalingrad and the tragic German defeat in the war against the hated Bolshevism. But life went on, the war too. After the inferno of the destructive battle, a person with the least spiritual substance could not just dream about food and revel in memories. He needed a new sense of life, a new support, and a real hope. He needed to escape from the relentless honorable self-respect in personal ways and in the ways of our people that had led us to defeat. It applied too to any dealings with the Soviet state, with its social order and its goals, especially with the sources of its might and strength that we had apparently so rudely underestimated. In this concern with understanding oneself, books were valuable assistance. In the camp, there was an extensive library equipped with the finest fiction and political literature in the German language. The library came under a German NCO called Bayer. No one was obliged to serve themselves, nor did anyone have to sign for the books taken out. 
Once our lives had begun to take on a regular pattern again and the usual sources of conversation were exhausted, I went to the library to find my way around. For over a quarter of an hour I leafed through the registers, and then I selected several German classical romances and books for Paulus and Schmidt. Almost all the prisoners were then asking for fiction. One day, when I had already become a keen user of the library, the librarian offered me some of the brochures lying on a display table. These were explanatory texts against Hitler. I knew that these were hardly ever read by the officers, but nevertheless I picked up several copies and read the titles and some extracts here and there. I did not like the language at all. It was full of fascism, imperialism, militarism, revenge. It seemed to me as if some things were simply asserted but not proved. I did not feel interested and therefore did not take the brochures with me. But I went off with a blue-bound book entitled The Land of Socialism, Today and Tomorrow. It contained the Central Committee's report on the 18th Party Day of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the 10th March 1939. The book fascinated me because it gave me for the first time a representation of the development of society, economy, and culture in the Soviet Union. This brought comparisons with Ukraine, whose backwardness I had got to know during the First World War as a young second lieutenant and orderly officer of a German infantry brigade. I took the book in order to learn more about the Soviet Union, especially about socialism. I also wanted to concern myself with the works of Marx and Engels for the theoretical basis of socialism. I had heard their names at school in connection with the 1848 revolution. Otherwise, I knew only that Karl Marx had written a thick book about capitalism. So I asked for Das Capital at the camp library. I read some of it but did not understand the meaning of it. There were ideas in it that I had never heard of before in my life. I lacked not only the knowledge but also the will to conduct a successful study of this work. Disappointed, I returned the book. I got on better with the works of Friedrich Engels. I followed his historical works especially his military historical dissertation, with great interest. By then I was not far from a new, firm, mental point of view, but from the first day of captivity I did not count myself as one of Hitler's obstinate, inveterate followers. Full of indignation, I saw how those officers and generals who I knew had condemned Hitler and his system in Stalingrad now appeared to have forgotten everything. When one day I heard two officers greet each other with Heel Hitler, Loudly and demonstratively on the camp road, I was at first glance inclined to think it had been a mental derangement. Soon, however, I had to accept that there were many among the generals and officers who remained fanatical adherents of Hitler, despite their experiences on the Volga. Among them were Colonel General Horst and Lieutenant General Artur Schmidt, the Sixth Army's former chief of staff. Some of the stress that I had felt in living together with him was rooted in his radical approval of the war. My hatred of Hitler and his rule was reinforced when I discovered that the Fuhrer had forbidden the dispatch of Red Cross postcards written by members of our families. How happy I was, like all the other occupants of the camp, at last to receive the first card in March 1943. Thus within a few weeks my wife and daughter would be relieved of their worst concerns, and we could write a card every month. In fact, the next card arrived in April. Then came a rumor that shocked me. Hitler had declared in a radio address to the German people that the Stalingraders were dead. We wanted to know for certain, so we asked both the Soviet camp commandant and the German anti-fascists who visited our camp. Hitler's betrayal of the members of the Sixth Army was confirmed by both parties. We had already been two months in Krasnogorsk when the Soviet duty officer and an interpreter appeared in our cabin one afternoon and announced the camp commandant's orders, get ready. The generals and Colonel Adam are being moved to another camp, rations to be collected immediately. This was on the 25th April, a warm spring day. We were ready to go within half an hour, but we had to wait for the order to go outside. The day was already coming to an end when we assembled with our baggage at the barrack gate. We were called forward by name and climbed into a bus, only Paulus taking the seat in a car. The escort was divided up between two trucks, then we set off for Moscow. It was dark when we neared the outskirts. On the right side of the street ranged multi-storied houses, some only partly completed. Most still had scaffolding around them. The interpreter explained to me that the building work had had to be abandoned on the outbreak of war. 
During the night we crossed Moscow from west to east, the broad streets were unlit and almost empty of people. In one square the interpreter indicated the large buildings of the Belarusian railway station. At last we left the sea of buildings behind us. We were so strongly bumped about on the rough country roads that sleep was out of the question for a long time. Finally fatigue overtook us and conversation died down. I too dozed off until a loud s'more behind me woke me with a start. I looked at the time midnight had passed. Somewhere between sleeping and waking I noticed we were passing several large villages and later a town. Day was beginning. I was finally awake. Where are we? I asked the interpreter. He gave a sleepy reply. In Vladimir, which did not stop me asking. How much longer will it take until we reach our destination? You will soon see for yourself, he said. Our vehicle was fast approaching a small town. The copper roofs of numerous towers were visible from afar in the spring sunlight. This was Sustel, an old prince's and bishop's seat. We went through the massive open gate of a fortress wall with its loopholes and defensive towers to a long building complex, whose center point was a church with five onion towers and a bell tower standing before it. Along the sides crouched long buildings of one or two stories used as accommodation for officer prisoners of war. The commandant, Colonel Novikov, a worry officer with a light but ringing commanding voice, took us to our quarters. I was allocated a room with Schmidt. As in Krasnogorsk, the first days in Suzdal were taken up with adjusting to our changed circumstances. Suzdal offered material for several interesting studies. It was the former capital of the Suzdal Kingdom, one of the three Russian principalities after those of Novgorod and Kiev. Its fortress-like appearance was due to the former danger from the Tartars. Until the fall of the Tsars it had formed with its vast acreage, one of the trading bastions most closely connected with the Tsar and the church. It had become a dreamy country town, and now it housed within its walls prisoners of war, officers of the Romanian, Hungarian, Italian, and German armies. In the months of June and July, I experienced the famous White Nights here. Up until midnight, it was so light that one could read outside. Equally wonderful were the early morning hours and the time shortly before sundown. Nature, buildings and people took on such splendid colors under the flood of light as I have never experienced before or since. Looking back, the stay in Suzdal left a lasting impression on me. On one of the warm summer evenings of 1943, I had an encounter with Professor Arnold. He had come to Suzdal from Moscow and was expressly at the disposal of the generals and officers. Most of us had questions and problems enough. Arnold seemed to me to be small in stature, but soon after his first words I noted that I had a spirited, extraordinary, highly intellectual man in front of me, a clever, kindly person to converse with, who had an exceptional command of the German language. Our conversation quickly revealed the character of an informal conversationalist, although our talk soon became heated when we spoke about German history of the last 150 years. History had always interested me, and not only professionally as a former teacher. I had worked my way through the works of Trischk, Seibel, Rank, and many others. I was proud of my knowledge of history and imagined I had a firm view of it. Professor Arnold proved that in the disastrous course of German history, in the decisive points of 1813, 1848, 1870-71, 1918, and 1933, it was not the German people, not the Democrats, but the anti-democratic forces that had won. The people had fought well and made sacrifices, but politically they had always been defrauded of the fruits of their fighting. And further, the German people had been misused, unlike any other people, for a war that was not in the national interest, but for the self-seeking conquests and goals of its ruling elite. Please understand me correctly, said Professor Arnold. I am far from contradicting the German people's great humanitarian traditions, their towering contribution to the spiritual treasure chamber of humanity. Already we Soviet people treasure the greatness of those German spiritual giants, Goethe and Schiller, Kant and Hegel, Bach and Beethoven, Kepler and Einstein, not to mention Marx and Engels, who have really become the teachers in our country. But think of Bismarck, the Prussian junker, who had boundless contempt for democracy and the will of the people. Excuse me, I interrupted him, but Bismarck was the blacksmith of German unity, the creator of the Reich. 
Certainly Bismarck had shown an understanding of the historical necessity that German unification had long since put on the agenda. But please consider how and by what forces the German Kaiser Reich of 1871 was grounded. When Bismarck became minister president of Prussia in 1862, he proclaimed that the problems of the time would be decided not by liberal ideas, but by blood and iron. The Reich came about as a result of three wars. It was founded in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, not by the German people, but by the German princes. The princes, not the then already economically leading burghers, had the political power of the Kaiser Reich in their hands. They were, however, ultimately responsible to God for their deeds. I don't understand your criticism of Bismarck's politics. He was all for good neighborly relations with Russia and concluded the German-Russian reassurance agreement. Let us leave open the question whether Bismarck really wanted good neighborly relations with Russia, said Arnold, taking up my objection, and let us look overall at the motives for his Russian policy, which for me seemed to have been dictated more by fear than by friendship. For one has to recognize certain realistic aims of this foreign policies. Bismarck as a statesman was in this aspect much more far-sighted than that lunatic Hitler. Had Hitler learned from Bismarck at this stage, all of us would have been spared much suffering. Apart from this, Hitler has taken many negative things from Bismarck's policies, the hatred of democracy, worker mobility and socialism, the struggle for power, war-lusting national socialism, social demagogy. From the Bismarck era, a straight line leads directly into the chauvinism of Wilhelm II and to the excessive conquest plans of Hitler, with which you too, Herr Adam, have been involved. You are talking about the same things in German history, Professor Arnold. It so happens that I have studied history myself and believe that I know at least something about it. For me, Bismarck is the outstanding statesman of his time. Perhaps your criticism has a touch of envy, and Hitler may have made some bad mistakes, but as a German I cannot describe everything that has happened in Germany in the last 10 years as bad. Certainly not everything has been bad in Germany in the last 10 years. There are Germans too, who with commitment, and often at the cost of their lives, fight against Hitler. What, however, has been very bad is that Hitler's Germany has assaulted other people and taken them over by war. Now that has to be bitterly paid for. We parted without having agreed, but still it was beginning to dawn on me that we were operating from different basic positions. Professor Arnold considered historical development and historical events strongly from the standpoint of the masses. He saw the true driving force of history in the workers, farmers, businesses, manual laborers and other working strata of the people. He assessed at the same time a scale for the evaluation of historical precedents and the historical acts of individual persons. Even the acts of German generals and officers, including mine, the professor said that in this war we were pursuing a bad thing, that we were conducting an illegal war. Rights, morals and historical precedent were not on our side. For some 2,000 kilometers from Germany's borders, we were trying to deliver a deadly blow to the Soviet Union. Rights and historical progress stood and remained on the side of the Soviet people and its Red Army, which was defending its homeland and its established order of society with its blood sacrifice. The words of the Soviet professor worked within me like a thorn. I tried to wipe it away, but the thorn did not weaken, just bored deeper in. The questions raised occupied me day and night. I was angry with myself because I had been so arrogant in my conversation with him and had not simply accepted the arguments of my partner in our discussion. But I really wanted to investigate his point of view. No real opinion can be formed with a door-rejecting attitude. Counter-argument must be through much more fundamentally and critically. We then turned to questions about the Second World War. I had once honestly believed in Hitler's plan for a new order in Europe. Absolutely convinced by it. I had gone into France to resolve the insult of Versailles. Equally honestly had I gone into the Eastern Campaign, albeit with some inner unease, because the Soviet Union appeared to me to be a power with so much unknown about it. I first had serious doubts about it in the cauldron on the Volga. Nevertheless, my doubts hardly touched the question of whether the war was correct or incorrect, but rather formed a criticism of Hitler's strategic concept, not just of a two-front war but in arousing the hostility of almost the whole world. I was now able to follow the vocabulary of preventative war, but I had never believed it so correct 
and in the last minutes I had become convinced that it was only needed by Hitler as a propaganda tool in order to justify the breach of the agreement and give the war against Soviet Russia a moral appearance. As I had undertaken to listen to my interlocutor's arguments and not to squash them with my know-it-all attitude, I kept quiet. Arnold, taking my silence as unspoken contradiction, then continued after a short pause more sharply than before. With your interest in historical questions, you have surely read Hitler's main camp. Remember the place where he said, we stop the German march to the south and go over to ground policy in the east. In more accurate German than means, we will rob the Slav peoples of their territory and their natural treasures and turn them into our working animals. Look at the tirades of hatred and abuse that were delivered against Bolshevism at the Nuremberg Party days. Think of the practice of plundering and especially the mishandling of people that during your membership of the German Eastern Army you could not have missed, or remember Goebbels' speech in the summer of 1942 in which the Reich's propaganda minister proclaimed the robber character of the war when he spoke of the lining of pockets, but he was not speaking of some idea or other but rather of wheat, coal, oars, and oil. Remember, Colonel Adam. Yes, I remembered. I also wanted to admit it. But then everything we had striven for and believed in, and for which we had been ready to put our lives at stake in this stream of blood and tears, would become evil and false. I wanted to talk to Professor Arnold about these doubts, but Schmidt then entered the room. He must have heard the last words and immediately joined in the talk. As formerly so often in the cauldron, even now he wanted to dominate the course of the conversation. In his arrogance, he lost all proportion in his performance and was on the verge of insulting the Soviet professor. Arnold smiled, sucked in his cheeks, rose, nodded slightly at Schmidt and left the room. I'd escorted him to the door of the block and apologized for the unwelcome incident. We parted with a hearty handshake. Unfortunately, there were no more chats with Professor Arnold as soon afterwards he left Sustel. He had helped me take the first steps on the stony, difficult path to new shores by giving me valuable assistance in opening up new problems, understanding and feeling for certain ways, but ripping up false trails. Schmidt's entrance had made me realize that the clarification process would be associated with conflicts in our own ranks. Obviously, it would lead firstly to a dispute among the Germans themselves. Even the older ones in the order of rank known to me for decades, from the highest commander or highest war lord, from the field marshals, generals, staff officers, captains and lieutenants down to the lowest soldier. All was up for discussion, by rank, authority and obedience to duty precisely classified. It did not apply to the position within the military hierarchy. The question was what goals the individual objective served. Was each man just a tool, the foil of an unjust, immoral war of conquest, did he remain a staunch follower of a leadership that did not hesitate to commit crimes, or did he say away with it and go against it? From these questions arose the separation between fascists and anti-fascists, which the experiences of the Krasnogorsk camp and Sustel, and also from leaflets of various propaganda works in the camp library, had not rendered so intelligible. Accordingly, I then thought, Schmidt's behavior was that of a fascist. Where then did I, Wilhelm Adam, fit in? who had been promoted to colonel by Hitler and decorated with the Knight's Cross. These questions remained. Months went by before I finally cleared them up. One day in 1943, Colonel Novikov announced through an interpreter that there were some Germans come to visit the field marshal. Hardly had I informed Paulus when the camp commandant and the interpreter were already on the steps of our accommodation. In their company was an old man with white hair. With the words, this is Herr Wilhelm Pieck who wants to talk to you, Field Marshal, the Colonel introduced the visitor. Wilhelm Pieck supplemented this. He was a member of the German Reichstag and wanted to speak to Paulus about the faith of the German people. As I was about to excuse myself, he smilingly waved me down. Stay here. What I have to say to you, you should quietly listen to, it concerns you too. With a certain reticence, Paulus invited his visitor to sit down at the table near the window. I sat down to the side with Novikov and the interpreter. This then was the communist Wilhelm Pieck. I had never seen him before. Only faintly could I remember his name from the time before 1933. He had a worthy enough appearance, I thought, as I looked on. Goodness and understanding came from his eyes. What would he make of Paulus? 
The field marshal looked at him silently. Apparently, he wanted to offer the visitor no bridge to a conversation, but rather wait. Wilhelm Pieck then opened the conversation. I wanted to ask about you, field marshal. Apparently, you are surprised that I, a communist, who must have immigrated from the homeland, should come to you. But I really need to talk to you. This sounded so natural, so sincere, that Paulus' voice took on a warmer tone. I thank you for your interest, Herr Pieck. As you can see, I am well accommodated. My health has considerably improved in the last weeks. Colonel Novikov looks after us. We have German and Russian doctors. The food is good and sufficient. One could not expect more as a prisoner of war. You, Field Marshal, and many other Germans would have been spared imprisonment if you had not let Hitler and his team lead you, retorted the visitor. You can see, Herr Pieck, that I am a soldier. As a soldier, I have to fulfill the orders of my superiors. I have never concerned myself with the political aspects. Field Marshal, you are a clever and well-educated officer. You must have known that Hitler had led our people astray and betrayed them. Or do you really think that the Soviet Union wanted to conquer Germany? Paulus appeared to be getting excited. I cannot imagine, Herr Pieck, that a head of state could betray his people and his army. Like millions of others, I believed Hitler's words when the general staff was tasked with the preparation of the attack plans against the Soviet Union. I also had faith in the high command when the catastrophe of Stalingrad was already well underway. This admission of disillusioned trust had not come easily from Paulus. I could see in his face how it affected him. Wilhelm Pieck was also lively. You were the army commander, field marshal. Your military career and position gave you a deep insight into war matters, into Hitler's methods of leadership and his war aims. You must have already thought about the critical development. The lives of hundreds of thousands of German soldiers were entrusted to you. Why did you fight on for so long at the Volga in a hopeless cause? Why did you believe Hitler's lies more than your conscience and your judgment? Why did you dismiss the Red Army's honorable surrender offer? Hitler is a criminal who never represented the interests of our nation. We communists recognized this from the very first and told the people. You and your generals also recognized it at the last in the Stalingrad cauldron and consequently had to deal with it, Field Marshal. Paulus replied dismissively, I have already said once, Herr Pieck, that we soldiers never concerned ourselves with politics. We dared not involve ourselves. Our basic principle is that the German soldier must not be political. I have remained faithful to this motto. Hitler was for us not just the head of state. He was also the commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, with whose orders we have to comply unconditionally. I did not know the plans and possibilities of the army high command outside the cauldron. That is why I could not simply give in. The conversation had come dramatically to a head. Two men who were diametrically opposed to each other were sitting at the table. They're the field marshal, a simple non-political soldier for whom blind obedience to the orders of the superior was his ethos. And they're the communist workers leader whose dealings regarding spiritual sovereignty and the highest responsibility were certainly to the people. Wilhelm Piet did not let go. So almost all officers maintain like you, field marshal, that they have become non-political and want to continue being so. What does non-political mean then? Do you not realize that you have played a not insignificant role in politics? Unfortunately, a role of a negative nature. You were pliant tools in the hands of the spoilers of our people, whose goals were the exact opposites of our national and socialistic ones. War of conquest, war of exploitation was their goal. And you, the generals and officers of the Wehrmacht, have obediently served their criminal policies. In a clear, unpolished way, the chairman of the German Communist Party showed that we had done some very damaging things for our people. In the end, we have become Hitler's pacemakers and made ourselves equally responsible for all the wrongs, damage and suffering that other peoples had experienced through Hitler's war. Regretfully, he continued, as already in 1914 to 1918, so in this war, our gifted industrial German people, our working people, above all the workers and farmers, have to pay the bill. Consider for once in whose interest this war has been conducted. Think of the Sixth Army's catastrophe. You have to go way back in history to find such an example of our people's misery and misfortune. Believe me, 
the whole of Germany's picking a war is a crime. It serves a handful of German monopolists and militarists, who out of the blood and bones of the German soldiers and out of the distress of the conquered peoples have made vast profits. Should a few marks fall to the population or to the soldiers, they are but tiny proportions of the stolen profit, mere pence for the participants. My party had warned even before 1933, Hitler is war. Unfortunately, we were unable to prevent the fascists taking power and the disaster they caused. We can and must avoid plunging the German people into a national catastrophe. That is why we communists are fighting together with all those who hate the fascist criminals and love the German people. Wilhelm Pieck then expressed the wish to speak to Paulus alone. Later, I learned from Paulus that the chairman of the German Communist Party had developed plans for the founding and leading of a national German committee that would conduct the fight against the Hitler regime on the widest front and for the speedy ending of the war. Emigrant workers, leaders, and writers would work closely together with officer and soldier prisoners of war. All differences of opinion would have to be withheld in the interest of the German nation. To the fore must come not the divisive elements, but rather the unifying aspects in view of Hitler's conjured up, immense threat to the existence of the German people. They both, the communists and the field marshal, were German. The history of their homeland moved them both deeply. If they united, Hitler must fall into their hands. Piet called on Paulus to openly turn against Hitler and to cooperate on the plan committee. The field marshal was as horrified of the consequences as I was when I heard this. Peek's proposal seemed unheard of at that time and we wanted nothing to do with it. On the other hand, we had to agree with the communists in their assessment of the situation and the nature of the war. Above all, Peek's personality influenced us as did the simplicity and convincing power of his speech and his glowing patriotism. This was no landless fellow, as the Nazis would say, and he stayed in our imagination and even haunted us. Looking back at these days in June 1943, I would like to say that Paulus and I appear to get a strong impulse for our own understanding as a result of our talks with Wilhelm Pieck. The talk stimulated us to cross over from the traditional area of military thought the officer's oath and military discipline to examine the question according to its political aspects. For the first time, it opened our eyes clearly to the importance of active resistance to Hitler and the pursuit of the war. Pieck stayed in Susdal for more than a week. He and his escorting poet, Johannes R. Becker, had numerous conversations with generals and officers, among them von Seidlitz, Latman, Korst, and von Linsky. At a full assembly of the camp's prisoners of war, but which the generals did not attend, Pieck asserted that the war was no longer able to be won by Germany. The Allies were also not thinking of seeking peace with Hitler. Thus, there was only one way of saving Germany, overthrowing Hitler and ending the war immediately. This was what the Communist Party was fighting for, but they were not alone. They called upon all honorable Germans at home, at the front and in captivity to conduct this war with them. There should be no political, ideological, or professional differences to hamper the vital chance to unite all the opponents of Hitler. Only a few of the prisoners of war at Sustel Camp approved of such speeches and talks at that time. The later development showed, however, that the German Communist Party solution provided a real alternative to the catastrophic policy of Hitler's regime. The communists grasped the decisive initiative to form a German anti-fascist fighting front, the seeds that were planted in July 1943 among the prisoner of war officers and generals would at least soon germinate and in some instances come to fruition. Our stay in Suzdal was about as long as the one at Krasnogorsk. After two months or so, at the beginning of July 1943, the order came again, generals to make ready for the transport. Towards evening, Colonel Novikov came to say goodbye to us. Provided with supplies, we climbed into our bus Happy to be outside the barbed wire again, a car was ready for Field Marshal Paulus. After a journey of several hours through a light, mild summer night, we came to a camp gate for the third time in the first six months of our imprisonment. We had arrived at Voikovo, the prisoner of war camp for generals. The camp commanded was an old colonel who spoke German. Unfortunately, I have forgotten his name. His deputy was a quite young lieutenant colonel named Pussero. The camp doctor was Dart Morrow. 
The nucleus of the camp was formed by a large former farmhouse built of stone. Opposite lay a second building, whose ground floor was also of stone, and a single-story administrative building. The finest thing was the laid-out park with an old stand of trees and a linden alley, which went right through the park and past the living accommodation that had until recently served as a nursing home for the Ivanovo railway workers. As in Sustel, there were here at first 31 generals in the camp, 22 German, 6 Romanian, and 3 Italian. Together with Field Marshal Paulus, I occupied two rooms, while for the generals there were single, double, and several bedded rooms. I was pleased with the well-set-up dining room and lounge. There was also a well-kept library here. Several generals had given up their rejection of political books and others had started thinking about it. Even if unanimity was displayed to the outside, the increasing schism in the general's front could not remain concealed. There were divided opinions about Germany's war aims, about the National Socialist German Workers' Party, and about the Soviet Union. Three groups formed in the first weeks after our arrival in Volkovo. To the first group belonged the generals who were looking for new ways forward and were considering how to turn the German people away from Hitler's catastrophic operational policy. The most advanced of these were Lapman and Dark Horse. The second group had inwardly turned away from Hitler and his system, but they were dithering, had many reservations and saw no new way ahead. Among this group at that time, I would like to count von Seidlitz, von Linsky, Wolves, and myself. To the third group belonged those who obstinately clung to the old ways. They were led by Generals Heitz, Rodenberg, Schmidt, and Sixth von Arnhem. They represented the point of view that as long as we remained together, we would ensure that everyone stuck to it. Finally, there were some generals whose behavior was difficult to identify. They mainly held back from the discussions. Field Marshal Paulus tried to keep out of all the discussions. He wanted to smooth down the ever more frequent high waves. During the first days after our arrival in Vojkovo Schmidt was transferred to another camp. This was regretted by the Heitz, Rodenberg, and Sixth von Arnhem group. Apart from Rodenberg, Schmidt had no real friends among the generals. Consequently, his departure did not affect those remaining much. A labor company belonged to the general's camp, as what Kovo was called, consisting of one-third each of German, Romanian, and Italian prisoners of war. They acted as kitchen staff, laborers, and batmen for the generals. Among the German prisoners of war, there was a whole number that had not only turned away from Hitler, but were of the opinion that we should openly oppose Hitler and his war. These soldiers formed the anti-fascist group in the camp. They not only won over the majority of their comrades to their opinion, but especially called on the generals to fight against Hitler and his system. This raised a cloud of dust. How could such soldiers dare speak to generals like that? Above all, Colonel General Heitz raged and complained about these communists, as he called them. But the anti-fascists did not let themselves be intimidated. As workers, farmers, or laborers in soldiers' uniforms, they realized sooner than we did that Hitler's war brought only distress and suffering to the German people, while some fat cats did well out of it. In the middle of July, there was a storm of indignation in our ranks, brought about by a new newspaper in the German language being distributed in the camp. This newspaper was the Fries Deutschland, Free Germany. There it stated in black and white that on the 12th and 13th July 1943 in Krasnogorsk, the National Committee Fries Deutschland had been founded by German immigrants, German officer and soldier prisoners of war, and surviving Stalingrad fighters. The few examples of the newspaper that we had received were passed from hand to hand. The main interest was not in the content of the manifest to the Wehrmacht and the German people, but in the names of those that had signed it. Every one of us found the names of officers and soldiers that we knew and that we had once treasured as friends. How could they have done something like this with the communists? That was enough to bring about a damning condemnation of them all. At the same time, it was satisfying that it involved only young officers who had frivolously broken their oaths of allegiance. The first waves of excitement had the generals packing their bags. I was no exception. It appeared as if there was real unanimity in the condemnation of the sheet. Then even the emotional ones calmed down. Several of us began to consider the events more soberly. We studied the contents of the National Committee Fries Deutschland's manifest to the Wehrmacht and the German people. 
I deeper I got into it, the more I had to say to myself that the signatories of this appeal had done so out of deep concern and responsibility towards the German people with this extraordinary publication. It continued that Hitler was leading Germany to destruction. It said in the manifest, no foreign enemy has brought us so much misfortune as Hitler. The facts prove that the war is lost. Germany can only drag on at the cost of inhuman sacrifice and deprivation. The continuance of this pointless war means the end of the nation. But Germany must not die. It is now a question of being or not being our fatherland. If the German people take courage in time and demonstrate by their acts that they want to be a free people and are determined to free Germany of Hitler and win the right to decide about its future fate and its place in the world, that is the only way to save the existence, the freedom and the honor of the German nation. The German people need and want immediate freedom. But Hitler concludes peace with no one. No one will also deal only with him. That is why the formation of a true German government is our people's most urgent task. Every evening von Linsky, Wolves, Rosk and I took a walk along the camp road. We discussed the war situation and the national committee. In our opinion of the war situation, we fully agreed with the manifest and the reports in the Fries Deutschland newspaper. In the half year that had passed since the German defeat on the Volga, Libya and Tunis had been lost, but most of all we had lost the Battle of Kursk. Seventeen German panzer divisions, reinforced by the 60-ton Tiger tanks and the 70-ton Ferdinand assault guns, attacked along a 70-kilometer front. That was a panzer division every four kilometers. Never before had the Wehrmacht concentrated so much attacking strength in such a crowded area. But the German summer offensive of 1943 was beaten back by the Red Army within a few days. In their counteroffensive, the Soviet troops were able to regain the cities of Oriol and Belgorod. And their attack rolled on further to the west. How much longer would it now take before it reached Kharkov or even Kiev? We knew that Germany had no more reserves available that could be set against the enemy army storming forwards. The manifest was quite correct when it said, the armies of England and America stand at Europe's door. Soon Germany will have to fight on all sides. The weakened German Wehrmacht, ever more closely surrounded by overwhelming enemies, will not and cannot continue to withstand them. The day of collapse draws near.